It's our Kara Bigelow Baker, Daryl Cruz, and Carol Yates. Thank you for joining us here on Cedar Falls Channel 15. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Cara Bigelow Baker. My grandparents were Iowa farmers. My parents came to Cedar Falls after college looking for better opportunities for their family. My dad, Dennis Bigelow, worked for JS Latta Company for 43 years. My mother was a school teacher at Pete Junior High for 35 years. Some of you might remember her as the hard English teacher. I was born in Cedar Falls and I've lived here my whole life. I live on Quail Ridge, um, or I live in the Quail Ridge neighborhood with my husband, Scott. I have five children who were all raised here in Cedar Falls and I'm a hairstylist at the Razor's Edge on University Avenue. So if anybody needs a trim afterwards, just let me know. Um, Cedar Falls is my home. Uh, Cedar Falls is my family. I know pretty much everything about it. I've watched Cedar Falls grow as I grew. We have grown together. I remember when Cedar Falls had areas that were largely undeveloped. And as I had a family, I wanted to make sure that Cedar Falls was good for my kids and now my grandkids. You want the city that you love to be the best that it can be for those you love. You know, some of my clients call me the therapist because people come in and while I cut their hair, they tell me all about their business. They laugh, they rant, they vent, they cry. And that's how I've gotten to know so much about the Cedar Valley and what people desire and what they want and what has caused them to have concerns about the direction of our city. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I am actually running for re-election, so I must have done something right to get invited back. But uh, uh, Daryl Cruz, uh, Ward 3, grew up in Northeast Iowa on a small hog and dairy farm, um, really quite small compared to what we have today. Uh, doing so, I appreciated uh, uh, being uh, resourceful with a little that we had, that type of thing. Uh, after that, uh, graduating from Turkey Valley High School in Northeast Iowa, I uh, came down to uh, the Waterloo area, studied tool and die work, and worked in tool and die for a couple years, uh, appreciating the manufacturing uh, sector of the, of the uh, marketplace here. Then I attended University of Northern Iowa, uh, got a degree in finance and economics, and uh, now I'm a financial planner, uh, have been so for 35 years. During part of those years, I was on the College Hill Partnership Board, uh, working with uh, situations uh, relating to rental properties, uh, that sort of thing. I've uh, owned and managed rental property in multiple states um, for 39 years now. Uh, I enjoy do hands-on home remodeling for my own properties and others. An avid bike rider, done 30 rag rides by now or more. And I have a great passion for problem solving, and that's part of the reason I want to be on council to uh, help solve problems. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. My name is Carol Yates, and I want to thank the Northern Iowa Student Government and the other organizations for hosting this debate tonight. I'm very pleased to be here with all of you. I'm running for Cedar Falls City Council Ward 3 because I care about our community, and I want to be a positive voice to help move Cedar Falls forward. The Cedar Falls we're living in now didn't just happen. 30 plus years ago, the city council, the mayor, the staff, the community decided to develop a community as they looked forward to the next 30 years. They developed remarkable bike trails that are a gem and an envy of our state and many other states. They approved the utilities internet services and they prepared a well-made infrastructure for the future. They started a highly successful main street that many of us enjoy, and there are numerous public-private partnerships that provide amenities for all of us. Cedar Falls didn't just happen. It, it took action. It took taking some risks. It took saying yes to new ideas. I want to continue to help move Cedar Falls forward and look ahead to the next 30 plus years. I've been serving on the City Resilience Committee for the last couple of years, and I'm hopeful that when some of those recommendations are made, that the city will adopt those. I've been tagged as a good listener by many 
and I welcome your comments. I will return all phone calls and all emails. I want to again thank the Northern Iowa Student Government. Thank you. Okay, um, I guess maybe we'll just dive right into one of the topics you just brought up there. Um, we're gonna, Mr. Cruz uh, will go first on this question. Lately, I have heard more talk about public-private partnerships. Do you see those as being beneficial to our businesses because of what the city can offer, or do those benefit the city as well? What are the key partnerships of the city of Cedar Falls? What and that should be? What are the key partnerships in the city city of Cedar Falls, and how are these partnerships being cultivated? Well. <clears throat> Probably the biggest thing right now that's front and center in many people's uh, discussions is the uh, form-based zoning and parking, the, the big elephant in the room as I've described it before. We have to determine is parking a privilege for the citizen provided by the city? Is there a collaborative effort to uh, have new businesses come in and jointly build parking ramps or off-street parking or some fashion uh, with the city? Um, you wouldn't expect necessarily a business to pay for all of it. Uh, it's a public use item. Uh, visitors come to town that are not residents. They need a place to park in our downtown and, and throughout the town. Um, we have streets that are 31 feet wide, but designed to have parking on both sides in areas, but uh, in some places we're not allowed to use both sides of the street. We're told, uh, landlords are told that their tenants have to park off street, can't use the street. I mean, there's a disconnect there. So it's a public paid facility. So you should be able to use it. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Gates. Thank you. Um, I would say that another one being talked about now that I've heard through the city council is the new river development that looks very interesting. And a lot of people seem to be um, pumped out up about that. I think it would attract a lot of people to participate in activities on the river and it would be something that could be uh, for all ages of people and I think that that's an important thing to serve the whole community um, not just one specific targeted area. Another uh, partnership has been the Gallagher Blue Dorn Performing Arts Center <laughs> that has um, been wonderful for so many of us again all ages and I especially like the neighborhood participation that they have done this summer, the outreach to neighborhoods in our community. Um, and in addition to that, I'd like to see Cedar Falls expand partnership with the broader Cedar Valley. We are part of that. And I think it would be wonderful and imperative for us to um, get more involved in the broader Cedar Valley. Thank you. Go ahead. I think that the public-private um, partnership is key within the city. I think one thing that has been taken advantage of over time is the TIF, the tax increment, um, or the financing through some developers that have used that over time as the primary way to finance their um, developments. I think that should be broadened out to other areas within the city and some of those developers need to come to the table and um, start introducing some of their own investment um, versus using um, city tax financing. Um, I think that to keep people and graduates of UNI especially interested in staying in the Cedar Valley, we need to be more competitive with our lifestyle um, and what we can offer for cost of living and being competitive in salaries and such, and some things that we can do um, that ties into the resilience plan is offering maybe a conservation center that has living and active engagements for a community that is beyond Hartman Reserve. Thank you. Uh, next question for Ms. Yates. Um, we continue to see an economic impact to Cedar Falls due to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. What role should the city play in its recovery from the pandemic and what is your plan to help businesses and residents in Cedar Falls? I know that a lot of people have noted, especially the restaurants are hurting and it's very hard to find employees and the hotels. I've heard people talk about that, that there are, we need to have more employees in that area also. Um, 
Andy, I don't have a specific plan, but I think that it is certainly something that the city should be uh, talking about and probably in partnership with the University of Northern Iowa since we do rely on students in a number of these areas. Um, and I would, I would recommend that um, the city of Cedar Falls partner with the UNI Business and Community Services um, facility to help develop a plan that could be put in place to benefit the university as well as the city in trying to move forward from the pandemic. Same question. I think that for COVID recovery, um, one thing that has been obviously important within the community and communities that you know stretch beyond the Cedar Valley is the option of choice. You see parents who are attending um, more uh, of school board meetings, you know, for decades, people have been screaming that parents have not been involved in PTAs and not have been not involved in school board discussions. And now parents are coming to the table and they're more interested in what's being discussed for schools as far as mass, critical race theory, um, vaccinations, things. And, and then people are getting scared because parents want to have more um, discussion and input into what's going on in their children's lives and people want to have more input and control of what's going on in their business and so that's where choice comes into the discussion and so you know for COVID recovery we have to look at that people's freedom of choice how they run their business how they take care of their children how they take care of their families how they take care of their homes and we need to be able to bridge that gap between people and it you know it it might have to start just locally with neighborhood groups and you know at the local level within our city okay same question same question okay um it's it's interesting there's a lot of ways to look at it uh it, it goes to the private public uh partnership that you mentioned on the first question uh as a council we heard concerns from community main street to uh suspend parking uh enforcement fees that sort of thing and we did that uh, we had a couple uh, brainstorming sessions and, and, and then we went ahead and did that. Um, other things we may be able to do depending on the type of business we're dealing with is reduce inspection fees or uh, help businesses um, generate um, traffic. Uh, we have the Collie Square Mall that's there that uh, we had a recent article in the Courier that helped uh, show what's there and, and basically advertise and promote uh, some of the hidden gems we have. But basically set up a sounding board to have more uh, feedback, whether we have meetings um, here or other places throughout the town. Thank you. So the federal COVID recovery money, um, now the, you know, is going to the sewer project, um, which this person thinks might not be a key tool to the COVID recovery. Do you have any opinions on how the tax dollars might better be specifically utilized um, to help the businesses or residents recover post COVID? I think it was your turn to go first. Um, I don't, I'm not specifically aware of what designation has been put upon that money. I don't, I don't know what the limitations and requirements for that money are. However, if it's been designated to help with the sewer program, um, I know that with wastewater treatment and sewer, that comes into disease prevention and control also, and how our wastewater is treated and, and keeping the area clean and city cleanup. I, I think that's an important issue. I think it's important that we keep you know, people have complained over time about the odors downtown um, from the wastewater treatment plant. I don't know if that plays into that. I would hope that when the city is making decisions, they are considering, you know, is there incentive that, you know, businesses can be offered to help with getting more employees in the door and helping businesses recover as, you know, they've seen weaknesses come about. Same question. Could you repeat that question real quick? Um, the federal COVID recovery dollars that we're getting um, from DC, one of the projects that, that they're being used for is the sewer project. Are there other things that you think might be better 
uses of that money? Are there ideas that you have for how that could be used? From my understanding, a lot of that money is uh, tied with federal regulations and where it can be used. Um, so there are some limitations there. But um, it would be possibly something people could apply for, for uh, like the, the, the things we mentioned earlier about the COVID relief. Um, but my understanding it's real restrictive. Um, uh, again, going to the College Square Mall, that's a public facility right along our nice University Avenue. Um, I do know that uh, when we have large storm events, we have some parts of town that have uh, a lot of surface water. Uh, storm drains are not, uh, storm sewer lines are not um, uh, prevalent around the College Hill area. And there's some great need for improvements there. Um, and um, along those lines, I have to fit with the federal guidelines, I'm sure. Thanks. Thank you. From my understanding, those funds are to be used to help people recover from the pandemic. And to me, that means um, looking at things like child care. Many people have had very difficult times trying to pay for child care or even find child care. So perhaps that could be um, something from both sides, uh, training more people in being able to uh, provide child care and also helping people pay for child care. Perhaps there's rent relief that could be used locally. I know there's some statewide that needs to be distributed and has been. Um, transportation, I think some people have suffered because of a lack of transportation. And I'd be interested in working with um, Met Transit to see if there could be some additional lines provided for Cedar Falls to some areas that need um, more transportation and then to help local businesses recover and ask them what it is they need. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Mr. Cruz to start. Um, the, the council voted in uh, 2015 to you know, have an updated method for delivering public safety services known as the uh, PSO, public safety officer model. Now, six years later, do you feel there is evidence that the service model should be changed? Uh, <clears throat> there's always gonna be situations in the model where maybe individuals are not pulling their weight based on the way the program operates. But the model itself has been effective and actually has its roots going back to the mid 90s when the city started with uh, volunteers known as reserve officers to help out with the fire and police operations. Then in 2006, we had a paid on call version that was another evolution of the cross training where people from public works and wastewater were trained uh, for firefighter one and, and so on. And then, then we arrived at 2015 where we said full-fledged we're going with the model. So now everybody coming to Cedar Falls is uh, told ahead of time that we have both police and fire. <coughs> and um, uh, it, it seems to function well. The training is, is uh, similar. It's the same as what we've always had. And um, uh, like I say, there always could be individual situations, but uh, the model itself is working. It saved us over $600,000 in our budget over the previous year. Thank you. Um, the public safety model uh, is, is working. I would agree with that. Um, I don't know that things need to be changed, but I do think that people need to be better informed about how well it is working and what it means. And so that means communicating with the public in a variety of ways to be sure that people understand that. Um, it is providing us with firefighters that are well-trained, police officers that are well-trained, and they have two separate, separate departments. Um, with any service that the city has, I think we need to constantly or continually evaluate it and assess it based on a series of metrics to be sure that we are that we know and that the public knows that things are going well. I would think that we need to get a report to the uh, public and tell us what's working well, what maybe needs to be evaluated. Do we need more training perhaps? I don't know the answer, but I think that that would be part of the continual process. Thank you. Um, I disagree with both Mr. Cruz and Mrs. Yates. I do not think that the PSO model is working well. Um, I think there is evidence to support that it is not working well. 
We have had um, two major fires recently, one on Bonita, um, that the house was basically a total loss. There were four dogs that were lost in the fire and one most recently that was on First Street where a man um, was found dead in the house after the fire. I have been told that um, that fire, the most recent on First Street, the fire department or the PSOs failed to make entry to that house until after the fire was out. I have been told that the same occurred on Bonita, that the PSOs did not make entry to the house until after the fire was out. In fact, the house fire on First Street, they did not even find the deceased until after they were preparing to leave the fire scene. Um, that is not how fire should be fought anywhere. Um, that is not proper training. That is not what we are paying for as citizens. Identify what diversity and equity issues exist in Cedar Falls. How should the city respond? And if elected, how committed will you be to following the recommendations of the Cedar Falls Racial Equity Task Force? I forget whose turn it was to go first. That, is that me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I know from being a member of the Black Hawk County branch of NAACP that there are certainly diversity and equity issues in Cedar Falls. We probably don't always see those or know about them. I think that the Human Rights Commission um, plays a strong role in being able to educate the public about that. And to do that, I support the idea that they have a budget to help educate the public. Um, I would support that they would ask people from communities of color to come talk with them and find out what their concerns are. I know there are concerns from um, employment and there are concerns from education. Um, there are concerns, honestly, from people of color being stopped out of high, outside of Hy-Vee asking why they're there. Um, so I think that we need a strong human rights commission and, and I would certainly support that if I were on the council. Thank you. I think there are some diversity issues within Cedar Falls. Um, I think it doesn't do us anything positive to ignore the fact. Um, but diversity isn't just about color, right? And Section 8 isn't a term that is um, inclusive to diversity. So when the city uses an excuse to bring more Section 8 housing to town to help satisfy the diversity issue, that's not really solving a diversity problem. Um, when you're talking about diversity, we need more women. We need more LGBTQ representation. We need more people of color representation. Um, and how do we do that? How do we include more of those types of people within our community? We need jobs that um, businesses are offering to those types of people. We need housing in neighborhoods that is more representative and inclusive to inviting those types of people into their neighborhoods. And that's how you solve the problem. People have to reach across the table and make friends. Thank you. Could you repeat that then as well? Yes. For me again? Um, identify what diversity and equity issues exist in Cedar <coughs> Excuse me, in Cedar Falls. How should the city respond? If elected, how committed will you be to following the recommendations of the Cedar Falls Racial Equity Task Force? Okay. Um, I'd be very committed to listening to what is uh, presented. Um, my background is analytics and, and deciphering what is the intended consequence of, of an action and what's the unintended consequences. So I'd be very receptive to that. Um, as far as the barriers in Cedar Falls, I see our high cost of housing in our town. Um, uh, we've been very effective in producing very nice neighborhoods but the cost of those neighborhoods are quite high. Um, some of the things that I've seen uh, being promoted as far as uh, building, uh, we, don't, we don't have low-income housing uh, actively being built, and I think that's a flaw that we have to work on in Cedar Falls in some fashion. Um, so all these things like along the housing line will help people of color and um, various ethnic minorities be able to comfortably live in town and take advantage of our um, our features and amenities that we have. I guess it's now time for uh, closing remarks. 
Um, you have one minute, Miss Bigelow Baker. I would just like to close in saying that um, right now it doesn't feel to a lot of people with in the city that the city listens to its people and it is abusing its power by you know letting its representatives know when they can speak and when they can't and what issues they can speak about and which issues they can't um, people feel like they're getting robbed because some developers get preferential treatment by their friends in city hall and make millions instead of focusing on where development really should happen um, we pay the consequences by having buildings and closed businesses and worse traffic and no parking and the list goes on I'm running for City Council because Cedar Falls is more than a business to me. Um, the success of Cedar Falls is not just about dollars and cents. It's about community and people. And I ask for your vote to be your representative and have your voice and to have your back in City Hall. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everybody for inviting us here to speak, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, in my situation, I draw upon my 35 years of, of business planning and dealing with hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, proposals and ideas and concepts that are presented. And I enjoy doing that problem solving f in a large scale for the city. Um, I understand the concerns of people what they want to feel comfortable in their environment. The city provides a diverse social environment for them, uh, cultural opportunities, and they want to be able to retire in our community knowing that their world is safe and the city is uh, secure for them. So I ask for your vote. I want to continue doing what I've been doing. Uh, I continue to advocate for full disclosure and transparency, and I've accomplished some of that with the council packets coming out early instead of a Friday. They came out on Wednesday, so you got many more days to look at things and see what's going on in the community. Thank you. Thanks to Northern Iowa Student Government and the other organizations for hosting us this evening. All of the issues discussed here tonight are very important, of course, for the future of Cedar Falls. But as I've been knocking on doors and talking to residents in Ward 3, I've been thinking about my mom and her strong commitment to community. She was a woman who could do many things at one time. She really could. Um, she could talk on the phone, make a meal, make plans to have friends over. I remember the first time that a friend of hers ran for city council and the kids in both families were in grade school, but we were given brochures to take door to door in the neighborhoods. That was my first election experience and I've kept the value of commitment to community since then. I hope more people in Cedar Falls become engaged to help our community. There are lots of ways to have our voices heard, but sometimes we need to take the initiative to get involved. I hope you'll join me in supporting our community by learning more about the issues, by learning more about me, and by voting November 2nd. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the Ward 3 candidates. And the election is November 2nd, so please vote.